Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Our special guest today is conspiracy researcher, lecturer, truth speaker, and founder of Project Camelot, Carrie Cassidy. Thank you, Carrie Cassidy. It's wonderful to see you, and it's great to be here. And thanks for being on our show. It's great to be back in Los Angeles. Oh, thank you very much. I'm happy to do this. Great. Briefly, let's do a little introduction to your work and how you began in this controversial field as a conspiracy researcher and revealing all of these dark, hidden secrets and also getting into interviewing these fascinating and intriguing people about what is or may be going on in the world behind closed doors. Well, I was a frustrated filmmaker. I wanted to make sci-fi movies to reveal these same truths that I ended up revealing through interviewing people on documentary interviews in Camelot. And uh, so I picked up a consumer grade camcorder and I had a small inheritance and I basically started going to UFO conferences and interviewing people like myself. <laughs> all those years ago and I've been doing this now for 12 years and I was actually very interested in and I was ended up to be surprised to find that I was quite good at interviewing people and um, people seemed to like it and uh, eventually one of the first people I interviewed was Bill Ryan who was representing the Serpo project and he was uh, he was a webmaster who had volunteered to put all the uh, information regarding Serpo into a, a website so people could search and read it and so on. And that was from a mm -hmm. disclosure from uh, what ended up to be a DIA uh, disclosure. Mm -hmm. So Defense Intelligence Agency sponsored disclosure called Serpo. And it was about a human alien exchange program. And it uh, actually you can see it at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind where you see Richard Dreyfuss getting dressed to go on a ship and the aliens coming off the right. ship. So that was actually based on a real piece of evidence. Really? And uh, it does appear that we have had human alien exchange programs. It is said uh, since at least the 1960s and that there, were, there may have been uh, three or four or maybe we don't even know how many at this point. So Bill got involved with Serpo and I decided that at the time he was, uh, he was simply a webmaster. He had, uh, unbeknownst to me, and been somebody who was a fan of investigating conspiracies, etc., for many years. And, uh, and so he was also a good spokesperson for Serpo and I decided to interview him. So I interviewed him at a conference that was happening in Vegas, uh, the, I think it was actually Laughlin, uh, the UFO Congress is what it was called, and I, that's where I first interviewed him. I interviewed Bill uh, Hamilton, who's another Camelot witness, fascinating man, who uh, has worked in actually black projects to some degree. All right. And I ended up doing, uh, creating a small documentary at that time, and they were part of it. And uh, that was the early beginnings of Project Camelot, what became Project Camelot. And then Bill and I kept in a correspondence. I ended up going to Egypt uh, with that part of my inheritance. And I went with uh, Jordan Maxwell and uh, William Henry uh, because they were searching for signs of Atlantis in Egypt. And so I wanted to investigate yeah. that. Again, this is before Camelot. Right. And at that time, I often tell people that I actually interviewed Jordan Maxwell and found out about his experience with aliens at a time when he told me, even though I interviewed him on camera, that I couldn't release it because he didn't want people to know that he was uh, 
having experiences in that area. He was known as a person who was very knowledgeable about secret societies and the occult and all of that. But uh, at that time, this is many years ago, uh, be, talking about aliens could really put you on the fringe. So he, he didn't want to reveal that then. Now I've done a major interview with him in which he reveals all of that. Oh, and yeah. uh, so that was all those years later. Mm -hmm. So that was the early days of Camelot. Uh, as I say, I worked in Hollywood for 20 years mm -hmm. uh, prior what to that. What did you do exactly in Hollywood? I started out as what you call a reader um, and an, an executive assistant to top executives. So I read screenplays and I would recommend them to be made into movies. Right. And uh, I work for HBO. Okay. Premier film division, and uh, those were small films that were being made for television for HBO at the time. And I um, was a reader for ICM, uh, one of the major talent agencies, uh, CAA, and um, CAA. Yeah, Creative Artists Agency, not right. C, not CIA. <laughs> no. And um, and I also, uh, gosh, I I worked for a lot of companies mm. at that point. And then I eventually, before Camelot, what became what you call an independent producer and tried to get packaged, packaged films, uh, independent films mm -hmm. made. And I got some of my projects to people like um, the story, the people who handled development for Ridley Scott, Steven Spielberg, Kathleen Kennedy, uh, and uh, James Cameron, and others. And I basically hit a brick wall because I didn't have, uh, I wasn't part of the old boys network and I couldn't get my movies off the ground. Even though I know that there are excellent projects. Mm -hmm. I had projects like what is called Wing Makers and Wing Makers has since, you know, is a cult website. It's very well known called wingmakers.com. And uh, it's a multimedia website that talks about a black project scientist and uh, I became fascinated by that story. There, there's a book that is uh, called The Ancient Arrow mm -hmm. Project, mm -hmm. and I would shop that around Hollywood. And basically, uh, I, I, did, I reached a kind of a glass ceiling in those days. And, they didn't uh, want to have anything to do with it, or they didn't want to make it? Or? it I didn't know the right people. I didn't, wasn't able to get actors attached, because if you don't make a name for yourself in Hollywood, um, working on lower level jobs, unless you really get in with the so-called network there, it's very difficult to get movies made because you need to have a name actor attached. Uh, you need a name director, etc. So I know that, for example, Steven Spielberg had looked at Wingmakers and that story and was interested in it many years ago, um, even before I brought it to him, in fact. Oh. But I became the representative of that project and... Uh, and did pitch it there um, to, again, Kathleen Kennedy. And it was rejected at the time from her, by her. Oh. And uh, so I got rejections for my projects. I, one of the people I uh, had a project with, with was called uh, Dan Sherman, who became a Camelot witness. And he, uh, there's a story he wrote called Above Black. And eventually I interviewed him and revealed that story. Uh, we, I met a filmmaker that was working with him. I tried to shop that project. It's an excellent project. Even today, it would be fascinating for people, but was unable to get that project off the ground and, and so on. So that was my early days back mm -hmm. in, in Hollywood. And that's when I, I eventually picked up a consumer grade camcorder mm -hmm. uh, and decided to go make a UFO documentary. Mm -hmm. And that's how I met Bill Ryan. And uh, so rejection in Hollywood actually made you a little bit brave, and, and you yes. said, "Oh, I'm going to do my own thing." Exactly. And so I decided, uh, you know, to to do it on my own. And it was a good time to do that because filmmaking and filmmakers and digital filmmaking was just hitting the fore back then. And this was 2005. And uh, so I, you know, the equipment was there. I taught myself editing um, and so on and so forth and basically started doing interviews and put, trying to put my documentary together. Then when I interviewed Bill Ryan, we decided to put our two skill sets together because he was a writer and a webmaster. And I was, uh, I had written screenplays as well and tried to shop my own screenplays in Hollywood. So I was a writer and filmmaker. 
and uh, we basically tried to decided that we wanted to get the truth out about the sector and I had done a tremendous amount of research. Which you uh, would not have done if you had been hit the big time. If it, at, at some point in the early days, yes, if I had hit the big, big time. Although I always, um, we were talking earlier, I, when I saw close encounters of a third kind when I was quite young, I, um, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring the truth out through movies. And I still believe this to this day, that the best way to get the truth out is through fiction. And it's uh, also a lot safer than, than the road I chose. <laughs> in Camelot because uh, if you are saying it's a fiction, you can kind of hide behind that and they will be less likely to want to target you. Then if you try to do it the way I've done it, which is through as an investigative reporter, documentary filmmaker, which is actually what I, I am at this point. Mm -hmm. Of all of those many incredible interviews you've, you've done mm -hmm. for those 12 years and all those incredible people you've met, are there any specific ones that you can select or you can say, oh, that those ones were the most memorable? Uh, that's always a hard question. Uh, I can say, yes, I can obviously tell you Henry Deacon is one of, he's, he came out on, under his real name, Arthur Neumann. Uh, he was a scientist that worked in black projects and he was what you call cross-disciplinary. So he tended to, instead of what a lot of scientists who specialize, they tend to work in their own little specialized area and they don't know the bigger picture. In his case, he actually crossed, was cross-disciplinary. So he tended to have, to have a lot of um, knowledge of what was really going on in the secret space okay. program. He was one of our first witnesses, actually, mm -hmm. um, in the early days of Camelot, and we got a tremendous amount of information from him. But um, interestingly, he was not, he was using a false name, Henry Deacon, which we gave him because he wanted to have a, you know, hide his name at that time. And did and you then, see his face? In the no, he wouldn't, he never did a video interview at that time. All right. Later, he actually spoke at one of my conferences, and, and you can watch that footage mm -hmm. on my Vimeo channel, which it's uh, excellent, you know, footage. Uh, but uh, no, in the early days, he, he, he wasn't out under his own name. So he was only, in fact, he wouldn't allow us to tape record the actual conversations. Mm -hmm. So we had to remember after we talked to him, everything that he said. Mm -hmm. And then we, we would write it up. And uh, Bill did a lot of the, the writing at that time of, of the testimony. Why would he even talk to you about these things? Come well, out and do that. this gets into the psychology of whistleblowers and the fact that they are, uh, they're usually people that have been working for Black Projects, uh, the Secret Space Program for sometimes 40 years, sometimes 30 years, 20 years, but usually quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And they end up being, um, they start to realize what they're part of. They start to realize that the human race uh, is in the dark. And so they decide to make, they make a sort of, it's a crisis of conscience, if you will. Okay. And they finally decide that they want to be a whistleblower, in essence. They don't, Back in those days, uh, when we first started, people didn't even know what the word whistleblower meant. Right. They thought it was purely in a corporate setting of some kind. But we started using the term, and it's now become very popular and very well known. Like that Edward I can Snowden, you. for example. Snowden and Assange, both of Assange. those people were not out and around. And we were one of the first uh, websites to ever Use do that this kind of uh, word, yeah. interview with uh, what we call witnesses from above top secret. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so Henry Deacon is one such person, Arthur Neumann. You asked me for the most important. Exactly. Um, Pete Peterson is another person, worked for 40 years again for this Black Projects. Mm -hmm. He's something of a... Um, and can we, just, can we just talk about Black Projects in order for people to know what that is specifically? Black Projects are uh, basically projects that are above top secret. So they're not talked about. Uh, they have a classification that makes them so that the general public on every level and even people with secret, um, in other, when I say above top secret, I'm talking you start at secret. So it's way above that. It's above top secret and top secret is 
is actually a rather lower level, from what I understand, of the classifications, and it goes way up from there. As an independent writer, director, producer, when I went to film school, so I studied, and then I decided to, uh, basically we decided to tour the world interviewing witnesses from Above Top Secret who would talk to us. Mm -hmm. And as it happened, we, we hit, hit it at a time when uh, the zeitgeist was ready for that kind of information. And YouTube was just in the early days. I'm, an, I'm a YouTube director from the original YouTube. So um, oh. I, other people in the early days of YouTube would only be allowed to have, um, I think it was 10 or 20 minute segments. Ten, and, I believe, as far can, as I remember. And I was able to have two-hour interviews because really? I was, a, er, yeah, one of the founding YouTube directors. Wow. Because I had gone to film school and had yeah. the background, uh, and uh, so that did assist uh, Camelot in the early days. Obviously, uh, because we do. Um, also, this is the other thing we sort of pioneered in some ways. I would say, um, is a two-hour interview uh, that goes into depth. Uh, instead of using sound bites, not just a half hour, not just, you know, it, it, not what you see on CNN or, exactly. or whatever. So this was a very important part of our, our sort of mm. procedure, I guess, our process. And, uh, and we became very well known for that. It was very sort of avant-garde. Um, it wasn't done in those days. And we would go into a person's home. I flew all over the world. And uh, I, I was using, uh, in the early days, I was using the money from my inheritance to fund Project Camelot. Then I ran out of money and I made a bad investment. <laughs> and uh, so the money went even faster than it should have and uh, basically was down to nothing. And so we decided that we would start asking, because at that point we had an audience. So we started asking for donations. Right. And. It was amazing because people started donating, and that really kept Camelot going. In fact, does to this day, and it's you know 12 years later. And I can say that uh, the first year that we were in operation, we interviewed I don't know 20 or more very important interviews that to this day are, are more or less classics. That is the kind of thing that uh, put us on the map. Right. And I, I can say that. Uh, you know, it was the fact also that we were willing to do what you're doing here today, mm. which is basically yeah. travel to a location to do a face-to-face -face, yeah. uh, with the person. Yeah, great inspiration for all the stuff that we're doing as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Groundbreaking, yeah. Yeah. definitely. And, and we actually just thought of it off the top of our heads mm -hmm. in, when we went to Tintagel in England, which is one of the former homes of King Arthur. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of past life recall in this place. And Bill and I decided we would pool our resources and we came up with the name. We were both impressed with the round table in Camelot. And yet we knew that if we used Camelot in the name on the internet, we wouldn't be able to get a URL. So we had to put something with Camelot. Mm -hmm. And I was writing uh, screenplays that were based on black projects. Mm -hmm. And a lot of black projects use the word project before. Of course, yes, you know, yes, uh, Project always. Blue Bit, Book, Project Blue Beam, et cetera. MK so Ultra I, project, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I decided, well, why don't, since we want to deal with Top Secret, why don't we call it Project Camelot? And yeah. it stuck, and, and we were able to get the URL. Mm -hmm. What happened over the years is that in some, I guess you call them ISPs in some countries, are now banning Project Camelot. So, um, really, yeah, because it's too controversial, yeah. A lot, and, and in fact, in too Germany, Germany is one, uh, Germany, past, yeah, oh. parts of Germany. Oh. I don't know if it's all of Germany, other places, because we've had people report to us. That, well, that's a huge audience, yeah, absolutely. Well, we've done uh, small conferences in Germany, mm -hmm. we've had some very bizarre experiences there, really, <laughs> yeah. like what. Um, well, I was invited to speak at a conference in Germany. This is actually, you know, three or four years ago, I think, and we went to a German castle. And um, it, it was in a very out-of-the-way area, and it was a very small conference. But we, it was an Illuminati building, and uh, apparently 
I'm at times uh, quite psychic and I tapped into the fact that there were a lot of bodies buried in the grounds around the castle and we found out later from the owners that indeed that was the case. That was true. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. And that it was, uh, you know, sort of a place that where, where the, uh, I guess, troops were during uh, Nazi Germany and various things. And then at night um, I had a very weird experience. We were in a certain room, and there were said to be... That was at the castle? Yeah, there were ghosts that were roaming the halls, and <laughs> the owners used to... Uh, one of them was uh, actually Irish. She was married to the woman, a German woman, that I, I think might have owned the place, but uh, it's a very bizarre setting. <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's it quite something, really isn't it? really strange, yeah. Yeah, wow. But, uh, and the place where I did the conference was, uh, the whole room was with mirrors and red velvet and, you know, gold. And it was it was very, very bizarre place. Wow, interesting though, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we we're talking about those memorable shows that you've done and people you've met. You mentioned okay, two so now. I said Pete. Okay, Pete Peterson. I, obviously, John Lear. Uh, these are our classics. Bob Dean, uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are so many that uh, Clifford Stone, wonderful man. Um, you know, I, I can't even remember all mm -hmm. the people. You know, their names are not at the tip of my tongue. But mm -hmm. Brian O'Leary, very important witness. Um, Gordon Novell. And they all led you on the path of where you are now, like collecting sure. all of these pieces in the big puzzle. We were creating the big picture, and so every witness is contributing a piece. Yes. And so, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So why did you split up from Bill Ryan after uh, how many years of together? Really three together? years. Three years? Uh, yeah, and uh, so we ended up splitting in, uh, I think it was 2009, and... We had a lot of, uh, basically, in the early days, we got along and we agreed on every witness that we were going to interview. As if you have a two-person team, you kind of have to agree on everything. And so it was very easy in the early days. And then as time went on, he became sort of, I think, what you may say is more of a prepper. And I was not into that. And... Uh, not that I don't see a need for being prepared for the future, but my uh, personality is such that I want to be on the, um, the avant-garde, the front line, if you will, of the battle mm -hmm. for humanity and our sovereignty here on planet Earth. And this is a personal choice. I don't want to hide away, you know, and keep myself safe in these kinds of ways that I'm not interested in that. Um, so I think that interfered, and then also uh, we had started out in a sort of romantic relationship that ended oh, very quickly. Okay. In the first year, it was okay. over at right. that. And then when we were just friends after that for the final two years. All right. And then there were a lot of interference from people trying to, I think, influence, uh, especially him. And... Uh, I think there was one particular witness that is top secret who uh, had a very, uh, what do you say, um, controversial, competitive relationship with him. And he, Bill, believed completely that this person lied to us. And I do believe that the person is an agent so agents are trained to lie. That's part of what they do. But they also told us a tremendous amount of truth. And so you had to be discerning as to which it was. And there was one incident that happened and they had a misunderstanding over it and so on and so forth. And I, I'm not sure exactly what all, you know, it was something between these two men. And I remained friends with this person and Bill became very... Um, sort of aggressive and very um, unfriendly towards him. And he was convinced that he was trying to split us up, which he wasn't and had nothing to do with that. Still, action. it happened, though, huh? Uh, he was, you know, a person that had a very adversarial relationship with Bill. And Bill and I were already splitting up, and Bill got involved with a woman who was trying to get him to 
get rid of me as an interviewer and that he would be the star and all this kind of craziness. And there were issues, you know, that cropped up mm -hmm. over, and it's, it's kind of like what you might say, creative di differences. If you were in Hollywood, you would say that. But we also believe, I think that you could say fairly, that we became a, a sort of a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. uh, we were changing the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, uh, people that know Camelot will say this, and we've been, this has been said to us many times, that we changed their lives, that we changed the way the world was looking at this sector that had to do with, we were unafraid to talk about anything and everything. Right having to do with black projects and the secret space program and UFOs and And you didn't aliens. choose and select certain specific areas that you wanted to cover. You did kind of Nothing was all. off limits, really. Right. Um, and, and especially for me, I, I tend to be, uh, perhaps you might say, more open-minded. Bill was trained as a scientist. We were a very good team in the early days because he was science-based mm. and I was more, I don't know if you want to say creative, spiritual based and that combination worked really well and I had the training uh, as a journalist uh, prior to doing Camelot and also as an actress so I and a director and writer and producer yeah. and so putting that team together and, and his writing he was a good writer he, he's a very good writer and um, you know, he was, he was a webmaster and I didn't have that skill set. Right. So it was really a good combination to start what we did. Are you sad that it didn't work out in the long run? Um, no, actually it was a very good thing, I have to say, because there were some things happened after that that indicated that, um, that he would have gone off mission, in my view. He had other things to be doing in his life and he, he took what's called the Avalon Project, and yeah. made a very good forum out of right, it, right. Uh, which is a community, right, that investigates and questions things. Mm -hmm. And um, So do you support him in doing that? And do you support yeah. him now? Yeah, I, I have no uh, issue with him in, in that way. But I think that what happens is, you know, you have sort of, I know it sounds crazy, but Camelot had a magic about it, and it mm -hmm. still does. Mm -hmm and uh, something had interfered with us. Whether it was also helped by being targeted by the Illuminati and being taken down and being infiltrated by certain negative personalities. You think that was what happened? Oh, I, definitely, you know, all of that went on. But when you have to take responsibility for what you decide and what you do and the people you spend your time with and so on. so. It, it just became very, very clear that we, we even brought in some people to do mediation to try to get us to oh. work together. And we did that for about a month and it clearly went nowhere. So um, okay. eventually I just took Camelot back, so mm. to speak. Uh, it became and, a one woman band. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and because of all the places I've been able to go since then and the incredible success of Camelot, to this day, I mean, I've done well over 600 video interviews. Uh, I've covered, you know, the, a huge gamut and uh, traveled the world continuously, done a number of conferences, uh, very successful conferences, and continue to do smaller conferences because getting people to attend conferences nowadays is quite difficult. Um, and it's also a very risky financial venture that I tend not to want to do at this point if it's any larger than a small uh, venue. But uh, I, I have traveled Europe many times and done small conferences and, and really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that uh, we have actually, we've gone up by several million this year uh, in view, unique views of our uh, Camelot, the YouTube channel. So it's 50 something, I think, 57 million at this time. That's great, huh? And that's not bad, mm -hmm. um, considering we're so far out on the fringe. Yeah. And then uh, I have 185,000 subscribers to the channel. Right. So it's a very robust, healthy yeah. YouTube channel. And growing. And always growing, growing, growing every day, every week. Because people are becoming week. more aware all the time. How do you analyze or how do you think, how do you feel that you can um, trust people that you're interviewing? Who is telling the truth? 
who is just putting you on or saying something that is disinformation or anything else, how can you validate who is legitimate or not? Well, it's a, a, a many sort of a pronged approach because it's, first of all, like the CIA or any intelligence agency, we use what you call triangulation. So if you get three witnesses that come from completely different backgrounds who don't know each other and are saying the same thing, then you've got a, a very good uh, sort of gauge to begin to think that this, whatever it is they're saying, may have uh, quite a bit of truth behind it. Uh, it doesn't mean you take it to the bank, as they say, or, you know, I'm not going to stake my life on it necessarily. But after 12 years, and I, look, I did five years of radio shows as well, uh, weekly, and uh, several times weekly. So I've got, on top of the video interviews, I've got audio interviews, many of which have actually disappeared, but some are still around. Um, and we don't know how they disappeared off our, our server, right? But um, it's just one of those things where these I get attacked and, and things disappear. Um, but I can say we've also done a television show, and that was back in the early days. It wasn't released until several years after they filmed it because they put it on the shelf. It was so controversial. And that was wow. for a true TV. Really? Yeah, called Shadow Operations. Mm -hmm. It was a pilot for a TV show. Right. And what happened there was that Gordon Novell, who worked for the CIA and always denied it, and I always, I always used to kid him that he was working for the CIA, knowing that he did. And he finally called up late at night in Palm Springs where we shoot, we're shooting on location. This was a Hollywood, you know, true TV. Is that was a, before a network. Camelot? No, this is in Camelot. Oh. Uh, this is, uh, you know, right... It was, well, it was filmed, I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember when it was filmed. Mm -hmm. I think it was filmed in 2009 and not released until 2010 or 11. I don't know. I don't think I have my, my timeline right. But at any rate, it was, Bill and I were already more or less split up when we filmed the TV show because we got the, this, it was pitched, we pitched it to a producer who Bill had gotten to know and, uh, he loved the idea and wanted to do the, the film. And we were sold as the follow-up TV show to be follow-up to the Jesse Ventura conspiracy theory right. show that became worldwide. Right. And at that time, the story went that Jesse didn't want to cover aliens and that we would cover that area. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were supposed to be, like a sister TV show. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there were a lot of controversial things that went down during the shooting of the pilot. But one of the things that happened was late at night, we were shooting in Palm Springs and we were shooting with Gordon Novell, who was one of the stars in it, as was Bob Dean and Brian O'Leary and so many people. I can't remember if John Lear is in it, but maybe he is. Um, so many of our Camelot witnesses. And uh, Gordon called me up and said, I have to tell you that I do work for the CIA and that my superiors or whatever you want to call it, want to talk to your producer. So I connected them on the phone and they basically made him an offer that he was not supposed to refuse. <laughs> that was if they could take over the production and control of the TV show. And what was going to be in it? Everything. Uh, then they would allow us to go to series. And basically our producer uh, at the time said no. And so then he was fired. The director was fired. Uh, they took certain things, changed certain things, and they uh, basically put it on the shelf for two years. And then they released it with no advertising whatsoever. Um, we happened to find out about it like in 24 hours before so they released it. it was on TV? It. Yeah. It was released on TV uh, with no advertising. It was on the schedule for True TV, however, just cropped up, and some of our viewers... Um, our loyal fans saw that it was going to be on the schedule and they told us they didn't notify us they didn't notify the producers they didn't it just it it's this is how they you know sort of make sure that you don't go to series and so um, then we did an advertising campaign very quickly mm -hmm. and we it's you can watch it on my channel it's it's there and you can go to the about us page on project camelot and uh, get the link it's it's on that page as well yeah. So it's had a fair amount, amount of views because we actually took it after it aired that night. It was like a Friday night. Um, 
and and made we had a copy of it and we put it on our channel and no one ever stopped us from doing that and right. we basically have, it's had many views it's been stolen and reposted and um, I have it on my channel Bill has it on his channel mm -hmm. um, it's actually a very good show it mm. has all our Camelot witnesses um, and it's kind of fun and mm. fairly well shot um, you know it's not perfect it has some issues and some interesting stories mm. behind the scene but uh, yeah, so we, we made that show. So, I mean, we've had levels of success, levels of mm. getting close to mm -hmm. breaking into the mainstream, what you might call that. And he, what Gordon Neville, N Neville. Neville um, was CIA, and you suspected that without knowing it. And oh, you said yeah. that to him, or what? Okay, well, I, actually, I know this kind of got off topic because you were asking me uh, how I know if someone's telling the it's truth. Tr it's truthful and legitimate. Well, I, I use my intuition. I'm very psychic, uh, and I get a lot of information. I always have since I was a kid. And that has actually, I think, protected Camelot, helped save our life, help, uh, you know, with, with choosing the right people to interview versus the wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people are telling a version of the truth that they believe. Some of the people we interview are telling the real truth. Mm -hmm. They're not telling it all the time throughout the whole interview. Sometimes there's a trade-off. Mm. I've actually been told by certain of my, our witnesses that they had to lie to us at a certain point. Oh. And in order to keep save their own lives. Uh, and sometimes we know exactly what that is. And, um, and so that's one of the things that has also, besides triangulation, the first thing I said, and so intuition and the other thing is uh, basically a tremendous amount of research that I did, that Bill did, mm -hmm. um, that has sustained me throughout this time in Camelot and then just getting a body of work right. that is so gigantic at this point, really seriously, uh, that, and I meet, I, people have to understand that not all the witnesses go on video, not all the witnesses even go on audio. Mm -hmm. Some of the witnesses are just sources that are giving me information. So they're contacting you or you are contacting them? They are contacting me. Right. In, in the case of sources. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Why do they do that and not want to go on camera, for example? Oh, because, you know, this is common in germ journalism, as you can appreciate. Mm. A lot of people's lives would be in great danger mm. for talking But they still to want to get the information out Absolutely. there to you. I mean, you have to understand that we're part of a revolution, and that's a revolution that's like a truth revolution. Um, that humanity wants to know who it is, you know, who we are. Uh, that humanity has a right to know what our, his our true history is here on planet Earth and off planet. And we have a right to know that, the, there, that all our money, all our tax dollars uh, are going into black projects, are funding uh, the building of a, of a super soldier program, uh, funding a humanity 3.0, if you will, uh, that it will involve transhumanism and AI, et cetera, that they have an agenda that involves Satanism uh, that is funded by drug money, uh, tra human trafficking, uh, you know, you name it, uh, trading pro what are called trading programs, high yield trading programs. Um, you know, and I interview the people that document this, uh, okay? So, and people that are fairly well known, like Catherine Austin Fitz, for example, documenting the trail of the Black Project money that's going down the drain, so to speak, that's leaving, that, that humans are, especially in the United States, but other places in the world as well, are paying for programs and paying for things that they do not agree with that they have no knowledge of, that their children are being recruited and used, um, experimented on, and uh, taken off Through mind control? Or uh, through, oh yeah, through everything. Mind control. That projects such as secret underground bases, they're working with aliens on genetically reprogramming humans, that they're abducting humans. In other words, it's a huge story. It's the most important. It's far more important than anything that's going on even in Washington today. Mm. Um, you have to understand that that's the project that we mm. started and that we are investigating and that I am investigating all these years So is later. that the, uh, the government 
that is behind the black operations? It's a secret government. It's a what they call government. it. It's more, it's even beyond what they call the deep state. Mm. Oh, it's beyond the deep state. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that is that part of the New World Order uh, agenda? That's or, part uh, of, yes. They, they, the Illuminati, as mm -hmm. they're called, mm -hmm. are behind it. The black magicians. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so much to the, to the story. But mm -hmm. basically, it's the high-level uh, ruling families. Uh, you can know, you talk a little bit about of that? Committee 300. Right. Uh, these, these things have been documented. I mean, David Icke was one of the first people to really sort of name names and follow the bloodlines because it's all bloodline related. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the ancient days of e Egypt, of Sumeria. Um, Zachariah Sitchin talking about the Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. Did you know him? I met him. Uh, unfortunately, he, it was right before he died, and he also wasn't willing to do an interview at that time. He was not? No. Because he was sick or just because he didn't want to talk to you? I, I don't know. I, I know that, uh, you know, there have been a few people that we were about to interview or we were hoping to interview, in the early days especially. You have to understand that in the early part of Camelot that there was... Um, they, they, in some ways, it, it's as if they didn't plan for something like us. Nowadays, people are doing what we do all over the internet. Right. But back in those days, other people didn't do what they were. You know, you could name them on one hand, for example, journalists that were doing the kind of pushing, you know, pushing the envelope journalism that that I'm talking about. Mm. Um, we were unique in the sense that we traveled the world with a camera. Uh, so some of those early journalists, and Linda Moulton Howe and Paula Harris are among them, were doing it, but they weren't using video. So we kind of came out the gate with video right away. And uh, so in that way, we sort of broke new ground. Um, and then we also specialized in these, as I say, above top secret witnesses. And for some reason, we were able to sort of enter a time when the... Um, What's happening now is that this whole sector is infiltrated, that there's a tremendous amount of mind control and, and witnesses that are planted with information. And some of them are given good information and some are controlled releases of information. But back in those days, it's as if they didn't plan for something like us. Mm. So we had a special kind of opening in which people, when they heard what we were doing, and then it was word of mouth, it went around the world that people, you know, I've been recognized in the most obscure wilderness situations where, you know, like in the wilds of, of Ireland, where someone said, is that Carrie Cassidy? Yes, you can do, you know, whatever. In other words, it, this kind of thing. I've been recognized in the streets of Paris. And, you know, I'm, this is not ego speaking. It's, you have to understand we were a movement of something right. that was different at the time, that was bringing in the world And you put yourself out us. there in so many videos. And when that grows, that, yes. that po popularity, then people will know who you are. The Internet is amazing that well, way. Well, huh? and it was in the early days of the Internet as well. Right. You know, we, we kind of grew up with it. Yeah if you could say that. And the witnesses that would find out about us would find out from other people who watched our stuff and would say, you have a story to tell, contact these people. Mm -hmm. They're doing the cutting edge mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So we, a lot of the witnesses we got were, we didn't go up, go to them, they came to us. Right. And actually even today, it's, it's often like that. Uh, although I do a live show on YouTube and I have now for several years, I don't travel as much uh, doing interviews. First of all, I can't afford it. So it became absolutely, you know, out of our realm financially to do the kind of interviews we were doing in the early days. It, um, it was good because at the time, Bill was uh, English. He had a car in England. And if you have a car in England, you can actually put it on a ferry and drive around Europe. So um, that facilitated a lot of the travel mm -hmm. that would otherwise require, you know, more expensive plane tickets and right. that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and so I, all I can say is that we were very lucky in those days. Mm -hmm. And the record is, is, is on the Internet. Mm -hmm. you know? Did you being a woman actually help it more because it's unusual to see a woman in that position. We For often sure. hear about, oh, it's a man's world, and but oftentimes it's actually a woman who can open the door to certain things because you're not used to seeing 
so many women in that in, in the in this field. Well, this is true today too. I mean, there are more pe women entering the field, but right. it's still actually few and far between. Uh, I You're guess, one of the few. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. It was a mission that that we had to do, and I think that people resonated to the Camelot. Um, I believe the real Camelot is behind us. Actually, I believe that that we are have picked. I know. I this is in my book, but. I believe that uh, I was around during the days of Camelot, and I believe that we carried forth the Camelot mission from that time. Oh. And that that was our sort of bond with humanity, and that we we did we did fulfill that bond. Mm -hmm. um, and in in essence, we have created what is the virtual roundtable of Camp Project Camelot is Camelot. Um, where, you know, you don't have, we're not about hierarchies. We're about uh, people being created equal mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that was our mission and, and that's what we set out to do and, mm. and what has been uh, very successful at this point. Right. You just mentioned the super soldiers and mm -hmm. I know that you're one of the people, one of the few people who were part of introducing the super soldier phenomena to the, the alternative media. Are those uh, super soldier witnesses or who call themselves super soldiers, are they real? I mean, we have seen people like the late Max Spears who died under suspicious circumstances last yes. year or the year before. Right. This is 2018, I think that, that was in 2016. Mm -hmm and others. Are they real? Is that something you can verify? Yeah, this is an augmented soldier. Uh, th they're doing this all the time. I mean, it's the super soldier, you could say it was a sort of a, a folk uh, terminology you, to, to use uh, to talk about soldiers that are being augmented by the military mm -hmm. to do more, to be capable of more, to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, more psychic, y you name it. Mm -hmm. Programming of the mind or yeah, the spirit, of whatever. The whole, the whole the body, body and uh, eventually it gets into transhumanism now. We understand it from that terminology. So that's really what a super soldier is. It's an augmented soldier, a soldier that has special skills, special gifts, some of which that started out with the rudimentary material in the human, but then were augmented and, and encouraged along sometimes by uh, DNA, uh, you know, genetic and, you know, engineering, uh, sometimes by nano implants and uh, other kinds of implants. In the case of uh, Dan Sherman and also of Aaron McCullum, for example, sometimes they were uh, created, uh, interfered with in their mother's stomach before they were born. Uh, in, because she was involved in some yeah, elitist in, in groups? Yeah, the story with Dan Sherman is that his mother was uh, basically interfered with so that he would be uh, become a alien human com communicator. And, uh, and that's all on, on my website, so watch his interview if you're interested. Um, and then Aaron McCullum, who was, uh, basically appears to have been a, a dolphin-human hybrid. Uh, and so he has dolphin DNA. And can that be traced? I don't know. I, you know, in other words, I didn't go with him to a doctor to no. have a test. Right. But, but he claims that. He claims this. And mm -hmm. it, there appears to be reason to believe him. Okay. Um, and you have to understand that in vetting a witness, I go through a very special process. And I do not believe in Camelot, our premise from the early days was that documentation could be faked. So it doesn't matter if you give me a stack of documents saying you are who you say you are. I don't care because Obama's birth certificate is a perfect example. Exactly. They can fake yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. So we understand that. But what I'm interested in is the human being you know, that I'm talking to. And when I deal with these people, um, part is, my again, my psychic intuition. Again, it's how they talk about themselves. It's the amount of work they've done to uncover hidden men memories. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's their intelligence level. It's uh, their personality. It's the way they speak to you. It's the human, you know, eye-to-eye -eye contact. 
how programmed they are or how not programmed they are or how they've broken through their programming. There are so many signs, uh, neuro-linguistic signs, uh, et cetera. So I, I wasn't necessarily trained to do, do that kind of interrogation, if you will call it that, or be able to vet a witness necessarily. But for some reason, I guess I, I have gifts that I You acquired I rely on. those abilities yes. as you went along with all of these interviews, huh? Yeah, well, obviously. And I was the key interviewer. So mm -hmm. I, you know, it's my human uh, right. sort of connection. Empathy. Oh, of course. Empathy. I wanted to be a director in Hollywood. And one of the things you do is you work with actors. And so you have to be very empathetic and you right. have to be able to imagine yourself in more than one role to be able to talk to or not actor about their role etc so i had training you know professional training in that way but i can say that um it's beyond that i mean i i believe now that it's it, it was clearly a mission that i was set out to to be part of i think back in my own history i was uh abducted by aliens i was uh i think i myself was augmented I've had evidence of uh, that I've been helped physically uh, as well as uh, in other ways. Um, Was that a clairvoyant telling you that? Uh, I have had some very, uh, you know, what happened in, in my early 20s, I decided that I wanted to reach enlightenment and I decided this on my own and I didn't have any teachers and I went and got a couple books. I read about it and then I set myself up in New York City and I had I uh, was working temp jobs and um, I was meditating all day and all night and eventually didn't even go to work all the time. And I connected all my chakras and reached uh, levels of samadhi. So I've had multiple samadhi experiences since then. That kind of, uh, it's a physiological, when you do that kind of thing, it's a physiological thing, which changes you. It changes your DNA, it changes your physi physiology and your it heightens your intelligence, it heightens your abilities to do certain things, mm. and certain, certainly heightens your uh, intu intuition. And did you do that as well without drugs? Oh yeah. You course. did? Yeah, yeah, of course. You can't do it with drugs, it's not. Because a lot of people uh, it, have experiences using ayahuasca yes, or but, but those or are, LSD. Um, those are assisted. Uh, you know, you can have experiences that way, but in order to do what I'm talking about, like go down this sort of road to enlightenment. You have to be able to have be self-generate. Well, it's self-generating. So it, in other words, the idea is that you become a sun, like a sun in the sky, a star and then a sun. In other words, you are uh, a human is simply, if you want to say the path here on planet Earth, you are learning to be a self-generating sun. So, for example, when you look at pedophilia and Satanism, what they're really doing is feeding energy off another being mm -hmm. in order for them to be bright and them to be alive and them to, to be young. But when you go into this, this form of meditation and you activate yourself, you get activated, then you begin to generate and be the light more and more. And it comes from within you and it goes out. So you no longer need to feed on other energies. Because, you know, we talk about pedophilia and we talk about Satanism and drinking blood and all this horrible stuff. And yet what, what it really is when you gel it all down is energy. It's about one being stealing energy from another because that being feels less than, does not how, know how to generate the energy from within themselves. They are not a self-generating sun. So the, the purpose of activating this physical body we have is that within us, we have the ability not to have to feed on anything outside of ourselves, but to be able to give to the world through our light that we generate by developing ourselves into, in essence, like a sun. Um, so this is a process, and that's why they call it enlightenment. And uh, Luminati know very well this process, and. I think you've studied some of this, so you probably know some of this yourself. But uh, it's not commonly talked about, I realize that. <laughs> There's always a choice, and the same thing with the Secret Space Program. They have made a choice that they don't want to take the time that's required to be able to activate themselves as humans. They want to go the dark path, and the dark path 
feeds on others. It's power over others. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a personal choice, and every human makes that choice along their path. Is that an easy way, or an and easy I, a shortcut? Or um, well, yeah, power? in a certain sense, it's an easy way, but it's not. It, it's it's never sufficient. You know, you must keep in mind the vampire always needs more blood. There's no end to it because they are never going to self-generate. If they were to self-generate, they would become more in, truly enlightened, not just the Illuminati as they call themselves. They basically deny the path of the light. So when, what I was talking about before is that it's very interesting that people fault, you know, they think, okay, we're gonna out the pedophiles, but you're never gonna out all the humans that wanna desire energy from outside themselves because they're not self-generating. They, they need to learn the path, you understand? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you're not gonna put all the, all the pedophiles in, in jail and then we're done, that's it. Reptilian, the reptilian side of humanity, the reptilian brain and the reptilian DNA that is within every human at this point, makes them such that they desire to be power over, to feed on others. I mean, humans are at a stage where they are still taking energy from living other living things, eating meat, eating vegetables, eating something other than sunlight. You see, we are still feeding on other energy sources. But do you think we could survive without eating at least the eventually, vegetables? Eventually, we will, actually. Eventually, we will. That's what ascension is all about. The, it's not... You know, it's, it's more physically based than people realize. It's not just a mental process. It's not just think good thoughts and eventually you'll be there. It's, that's where you get these um, sort of what I call, you know, new, new agers, agers or light workers, mm -hmm. light workers. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be light warriors, not light workers. But if war is like going to battle or combat. Going to battle against the dark because that's the only way the light is that's going also to a battle, right? survive. It is a battle. And, and so what I'm saying is you cannot deny that this earth is a battlefield. And that's part of, of the process of learning how to deal with the light and the dark and how it bring, bringing them in and basically uh, making them sort of merge in such a way that you filter it through to, to become pure light. Um, you know, that, that's the process, and all I'm saying is that when humanity is looking to punish people, punish the killers, punish the people that are sucking the blood from other parts of mm. humanity, you have to understand that this impulse is within the race, and therefore you're not going to solve it by putting people in prison or by killing a few pedophiles. It's never going to happen. That's not going to be the solution. It's it's understanding that we have to go into ourselves, that live the lives and go through the experiences that bring us the wisdom, uh, activate the heart chakra through the love impulse, etc., and merge all of that so that we can become, again, self-generating. We create the energy. There is no limits on energy. You see, this idea of scarcity that people talk about, Everything the Illuminati teaches in their schools since they're, you're very young. I mean, I know super soldiers that believe completely in what they were told by their Illuminati masters, that scarcity is the name of the world, that we have too many people on the planet, that we can't handle it. The planet is to being depleted. This, it doesn't have to be that way. It's a hologram. We are creating. We are the most incredible creators, and that's what we're, our true destiny is. You see, we not only come from a creator, but we are creators ourselves. Talk about that holo holographic world, mm. that, the hologram that you're mentioning. Let's just, let's just touch upon that big topic for a moment. I'm not a scientist. I can tell you I understand it intuitively. I understand because, you know, I've studied uh, the Mah Mahabharata in, in India. I've studied uh, the Bhagavad Gita. I understood... I probably did this in other lives. I, I, I took a class one time in, from an Indian teacher who said, you know, you know all this stuff, you know, and gave me straight A's. Um, I brought it in with me in this life, so I understand it. But I, I can tell you that the, 
Eastern philosophy has always known this, will say that this reality is all maya, okay? Illusion. Illusion. Uh, that's the same thing as saying it's a hologram, mm. basically. Um, you know, it's an image. It's a, it's a play to, uh, to a, learn a projection? from. projection? Yeah, yeah, in essence. And, you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter. Mm. It, you know, there, in a sense, there is no death. You understand? So when humans are eventually going to learn this, they have to know it. So what are they doing in order to find out that there is no death? They kill each other over and over and over again in uh, multiple lives. That's all they do. It's because death is like the ultimate aphrodisiac and attractor. But it's because really? it's not real. Oh. You see, and what humans are like little children that are trying to really sort of play with this thing until they can figure out how it works. And how it works is you don't really die. So it doesn't matter how many times you kill this vehicle. Mm. I don't go anywhere. I'm still here and I'll do whatever I want. You know, I'll come back into another vehicle if necessary. I'll move on, whatever I do. So what happens to us when we die? Well, that's just it. We, we have, a, you know, in essence, a soul. I mean, this is, of course, understood and known by many people intellectually, but they don't, they don't grok it. They don't really understand it. They still, you know, it's a natural thing. We've been taught so many lies since childhood, and mm. religion has been uh, a huge culprit in this yeah. matter. Yeah. So that people actually are so, you see, Satanists are, are what is called spiritual materialists. They fully believe in only the material realm because this is the only place they can have power. Once they leave here and they no longer have the physical body, have the power over others, money, you know, their greed, their possessions, etc., they lose their power. They have no power over. They, ha they are just this weak you know, desiring sort of soul that hasn't really learned its lessons very well and is going to be grasping to learn and feed on other things mm. until it gets to a place where it can actually believe, oh, I can walk without the help of other humans, without slaves, you know, to do my every need, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the path, you know, and... Um, I have to say that this is the sort of thing that I studied in great depth before I ever got into Project Camelot. So right. I'm not your normal interviewer or researcher in that sense. You know, I was never very interested in Roswell, for example. I probably couldn't tell you very many facts and figures about Roswell or its witnesses. It's only recently I started to investigate it more because I thought, well, I should go back and learn this thing. You know, but. That's not thrilling to me. When I got into ufology, I found out that they would talk about all the craft in great length and this sighting and that sighting and so on, but they would never talk about the occupants. And it fascinated me and I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. It's like talking about what kind of car you drive, but never talking about you. Who's inside. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the whole point. And I, mean, I want to really go into that and talk about these <laughs> okay. alien races. But right. I would like to just continue a little bit about what happens to us when we die, when the soul leaves the body. There's a lot of new um, stuff out there about that, actually. Some people have come to new ideas of what is happening, people who have had near-death experiences sure. or out-of-body experiences all kind of say the same things. Whether you are religious or actually atheist or anything, they talk about the tunnel of mm -hmm. light. You see a live review and you, you, you come to this white light vibration frequency. You see people that you have known that have gone before you, your family members, and you will meet, if you're a Christian, a Jesus figure or... Uh, yes, Muhammad but you know, this is uh, very traditional, also programming. Right. So, in other Perhaps. words, it's important to understand that humanity, as much as they are trying to learn truth at this time, there is also a huge dose of programming, of, mm. of trying to own the nar narrative by the media, by the media that are owned by the Illuminati and run by the Illuminati, by... in. Hollywood that is influenced to make movies that continue some of the lies and distortions. 
So that sure. can happen even if you have a near-death experience, a kind Absolutely. of really hard... Absolutely. You can still be going through a, a movie that someone death. else is, is putting into your mind, an implant. Even um, after kind of dying for a moment? Yes. An implant is... You can be implanted uh, in your uh, astral body, let's say. And you can also be implanted before you leave this realm mm. so that you take those ideas with you. You know, uh, I had a very interesting experience when my mother died. She died of cancer. And I knew long before she died that she was going to die, even when she started to look better and, and feel better. But she had gone through that horrible chemo type stuff. Right. And I knew it was killing her. And I knew she was going to leave. And I, I used to kid her. Um, I, you know, I've always been this type of person. But I would tell her that uh, you know, she must understand I wasn't going to cry when she died because I knew she wasn't really going to die and that you know, she would live on. And, I've always known things about my past lives and so on and so forth. So she would laugh at me and, you know, she would sort of roll her eyes. But what happened after she died is I had a very interesting dream. And in the dream, this was a few days after she died, uh, she was laying in a coffin. And I went up to the coffin and I reached my hand out and I just took her hand and pulled her up, upright out of the coffin. You did. She said to me in her, her normal voice that always talked to me, you know, Carrie, how did you do that? And I said, Mom, it's easy. You know, <laughs> and basically what I was learn what, what I was seeing was, and I believe this truly happened. In other words, someone would say, oh, it's just a dream, whatever. I happen to believe m uh, many dreams actually do happen in other realities. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. I, you see, this was indicative of what I'm talking about. She had said before she dies, I don't believe in an afterlife. I think you just die. That's it. That's the end of you and so on. And I was convinced that, of course, it was not the end of my mother. She's a soul. She's con going to mm -hmm. continue. And she was a beautiful soul. And so um, th this, you know, I didn't think I was going to have such a dream, but it came to me and it was so very, very real. And uh, a, a it was, it, yeah, perhaps it was the sort of thing where you see something so clearly mm -hmm. that she was having her mind changed by that experience of me being able to go in and she was just laying in the coffin because she thought she was dead. I think a lot of spirits do that. You see, a lot of spirits get stuck on their way because they don't know, they, they believe things in life that are completely wrong. And this is where you get, you know, ghosts, ghosts. inhabiting and being stuck in certain realities and so uh -huh. on. So these are real, you know, mm. and I've, I've seen ghosts and been able to interact with them my whole life. But do you think there can be a deception on the, let's say, the fourth dimension, sure. uh, the white light? Is Absolutely. that real? People are talk talking about archons now. Mm -hmm. and they're talking about uh, if they are creating, let's say, an illusionary dimension, even the white well, light, the karma yeah, wheel, I mean, all going of that back is, into yes. a body, white memory, and then a new experience to feed on human being souls. Yes. Well, there are ways to delay a person's progress, so to speak. But, you know, I have an ultimate sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, um, instinctual faith in, in the power of the soul and in the power of the light. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it matters how long it takes you to get from A to Z, so to speak, to return to source if you wish and to come again out of source. How do we return to source? What is that? Well, it's, a, it's simply, we see it as a journey, but you gotta remember that humans see things in terms of, in linear terms. Yeah, time. This happens, then this happens, and it's all simultaneous. Uh, most uh, scientists even will have to admit at this point that time and space are illusions. So everything has already happened. Yes, in a sense. I mean, that it is constantly happening, mm -hmm. that it is all simultaneous. Mm -hmm. We just tend to parse it out so that we can sort of focus. It's a matter of focus. It's like weaving a huge rug, but concentrating on just one thread at a time mm -hmm. in order to follow it through. It's that sort of thing. So it's okay to go to the white light and uh, if, if First of all, are well, it's feeding on our souls? It's important to understand that what people are calling the white light is not always the same white light. It's not, not all lights are the same. Not all light beings are the same. And you can be deceived by one being looking like a light being mm -hmm. when in reality it's a dark being. 
So they can so, change form. Absolutely. And, it, and, and all I'm saying is that I, I would be very careful with thinking that everyone is doing the same thing and mm -hmm. that all these experiences are the same. They're not because soul, your soul uh, sort of progress mm -hmm. is very intimate to who you are. So there is and a progress. To, yes, this, it, it's still an illusion of progress if you have, even if it's all simultaneous. Right. Again, because we are going through this process in order to, it's kind of like at play in the fields of the Lord, so to speak, if you want to call it that, put it in biblical terms. It's God, Godhead, which is made up of everything. It's just a word, Godhead. Source. It's not a person, source, the force, the creator. I don't care what you call it, but it's the idea that it is at play. It is ever in evolving and re-evolving itself and its facets of itself. And we are facets of that. Mm. So, but if everything has happened already, why do we need, how can we evolve? How can we uh, it's, progress? Again, it's, it, that's why I say it's re-evolving. Mm -hmm. Understand, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's more of a circle. Mm -hmm. You know, the circle is one of the most basic, uh, I don't know, platonic solids, mm -hmm. I suppose that you call it. In other words, the circle and the spiral are, to, in my way of viewing, the most basic and the most um, sort of containing the most information about this process you're questioning the about. The Taurus? The Taurus is part of is another sort of image that can be useful. But what I'm saying is that it is constant. That's why the Illuminati use the image of the snake eating its tail. Keep in mind that it, we are ever becoming and becoming and becoming. Nietzsche uh, put it very well, you know, the idea of constant return. So you're going in and you're coming out. It's like breath, your breath. Mm -hmm. You know, you're being born and you're dying. You're coming in and going out and you're never really dying. So that's not eternal. a soul trap, uh, like an orchestrated soul trap by these, I, these I entities? Think that, I think there's a, a sort of... Um, I think it's a fad right now. I think there's an overemphasis on this idea of souls being trapped mm -hmm. again by the white light, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I think this is again a program. You want to believe in it, go ahead. Mm. You'll probably attract it to yourself. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But it, it doesn't, it's not unique to each soul. It, it's, you know, you mm. can see beyond it. You may already be beyond that. Mm. Don't you but see? If, yeah, but if we are aware of it in this lifetime, then maybe when we die, our consciousness will continue, if that is how it is. It's and not going to stop your consciousness choice. from continuing anyway. You can be aware of it and hope that it helps you on your journey, mm -hmm. but uh, you may not, you know, you may be beyond that. All, all I'm doing is telling you that it's not something you have to go through. Right. You so you can choose to go to, to go source. There. Yeah, you can choose to do whatever the hell you want, ultimately. Mm -hmm. In other words, we, we are going there and we are already there. Mm -hmm. It's all one. It, it really is all one. You know, um, we do this for fun, for experience, for realization, mm -hmm. for, you know, for entertainment. And so do all the other beings out there. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is a process. So we're taking life too seriously, process. really, in this three-dimensional world. No, I think it has to be taken seriously. I think that, that you have to live uh, with integrity every moment. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think that's the only way to live. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it can't be fun, and it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it can't be continually creative. So we should and not live in fear of what is actually going on on this no. planet? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, you know, it, look, it's natural when you're a vulnerable physical being to be, to have fear. In fact, fear is, you're stupidly courageous if you, courageous if you have no fear. You need to, if you have intelligence, you have fear because you understand that fire can burn, for example. So... If you put yourself in those positions, you may understand that you could be fearful in the moment. But it's what courage is, is about overcoming the fear and being beyond it mm -hmm. and transforming yourself mm -hmm. and transcending it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really matters. The fear does not matter. The fear is an illusion anyway.
Mm -hmm. and you will get beyond it. All beings mm -hmm. do eventually, mm -hmm. you know. So going back to the satanic stuff that these these elite groups are using or they are practicing, why are they doing that? Why do you think they're doing it? Again, and, and it's a are choice. they doing it? Are they doing it? It's kind of like. Um, going down the dark path to find out where it ends and sort of teaching yourself that But path. why that choice? Because some people are attracted to the dark. You know, in other words, it's an exploration. Everything in life is an exploration. And these beings that choose that path, eventually mm -hmm. they, they will find the limitation. See, they're attracted by limitation. Mm -hmm. Limitation makes them feel safe makes them feel powerful. Mm -hmm. They have some very bad sort of inclinations. Mm -hmm. They want to, in other words, you can see what this photo is made of. It has, I think, glass on the front. By taking it and smashing it, and then we find out it had glass, and it really was glass because it breaks in many pieces. Mm -hmm. Or you can observe it and sort of kind of understand it and see it with your eyes and know it that way mm -hmm. without harming it. You know, you can do no harm. So it's, it's really a choice and that's what spirit becoming aware mm -hmm. is all about. Mm -hmm. And eventually the, even the dark will go to the light. Mm -hmm. But why do you think that is happening so much? You talk often about that happening in say, say governmental circles or New World Order mm -hmm. circles of, of the, these elitists and also in Hollywood. Can you explain a little bit? Can you talk a little bit more about that? How is it happening? Why is it happening? And wh why is that connected to something dark? It's a, it's, it's a level of youthfulness that ends up getting stuck as a result of its choices. So what happens in, for example, Hollywood, it's about power over mm -hmm. others. This sector is is one of what we call polarity it's a polarity between the dark and the light and the two are in essence in battle so when the one, people that choose certain lines of work and then get themselves into very dark places they do it out of ego gratification out of a feeling of being less than and wanting to be greater than in other words it comes you're either a power position is your either under you're a victim or you're all powerful you're you're in charge right mm. so they flip from one side to the other and and most lives are involved with going from one side to the other and most learning experiences are involved in that and relationships as well most relationships are not even not not the round table of camelot we're talking about but they are actually hierarchical Many people have friends, lovers, husbands, wives who would facilitate them getting through certain doors. They are, you know, following their own ego, following their own desires to be, you know, richer, fam more famous, more beautiful, more whatever it is they're mm -hmm. seeking. Um, in other words, they are motivated by a feeling of less th less than. And so this is is their drive to you could call it better themselves, but also to experience this reality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's understandable when a person grows up in poverty that they're going to look at someone with wealth and think that that's a better life and be driven to try to emulate that mm -hmm. person. If that, along that, those lines, they are required to do certain deeds that require killing people, et cetera, et cetera. Is they that are going what is to happening? Have to, absolutely, they'll have to make a choice. Right. If you're an actress, you will sleep with a producer to get a part. If you don't sleep with the producer, you don't get a part. I mean, one of the reasons I ended up after 20 years in Hollywood as not being on the team of the Old Boys Network is because I wouldn't play the game. So you were exposed to things like what we're taught, what we hear about sure. Weinstein and those Absolutely. things. You were... I mean, I didn't come too too close to like sort of uh, I guess I mean people tried to seduce me or whatever mm. it was but I understood like instinctively want to go to bed with. that I wouldn't go in that direction mm. you know so I had offers I mm. mean anyone gets offers mm -hmm. but it's what you do with it it's what you right. what you choose mm -hmm. you know I always had um, an inner integrity I mean I can say I've been through enough lives to 
to where I understand that I need to be able to look myself in the face, mm -hmm. that I need to be at peace with who I am, that that's my first and foremost most important thing at the end of the day. Otherwise, you're, you're actually bound to repeat it. Mm -hmm. That is, I do believe, how the universe works. Really? Yeah. yeah. So the karma wheel is true. And so it will, it will be for every person that does ill to another, mm -hmm. they will experience that and ill, you know, whether it's the exact same thing or not is another matter. But generally, yeah. So you, that's you, not just a story or an idea like, like many things in religion and hell and heaven. It's and life all experience. That. I mean, every human eventually finds this out. Mm -hmm. It has to do with understanding the learning experience that is this thing we call life mm -hmm. and what comes with it and, you know, what you take away from it. And if you get to know your prior lives, you can also, also sort of see your own path in that way. So many people who do visit their prior lives will know the things that they, if you want to call it, did wrong, the wrong choices they made that they may be doing right in this life, that sort of thing. You can get quite high in Hollywood, in my view, mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a sort of, on the road to stardom, if you will, and still be on a level of innocence and mm -hmm. still not necessarily be um, a victim of pedophilia or something. Mm -hmm. But at some point, at some juncture in your career, you will be corralled, you will be, had, you will have to make certain concessions to play ball with the Illuminati. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Whether you will actually be sexually, you know, um, preyed upon, you will certainly get offers. I mean, I don't think you can avoid that, but you may, you may refuse them and still be a success mm -hmm. to a certain point. Mm -hmm. I think there is some time at which there may be a push come to shove you know, even Camelot, uh, we understood, and this is pretty, pretty true of a lot of people, is that they allowed us to go to a certain place before they really, they interfered with us slightly here and there, mm -hmm. but then they didn't really like hit us hard until the longer we were on the scene. And some people get payback, um, you know, many, many years later, like uh, we were talking about Ronnie, I don't know how to say her Dr. name. Dr. Ronnie killed her. Yeah. yeah. You, the question is whether she was killed or not. Mm -hmm. They may have waited a very long time to kill her, in essence, but they could still have. So you think that could have been possible that she yeah, was they, targeted? Yeah, they and hasten killed. the end. Uh, sometimes they wait quite a long time. They use and abuse a person. Gordon Neville always used and abused over and over again, mm -hmm. and then they finally killed him. Uh, you know, this kind of thing is going on all the time. The Illuminati do use uh, methods remote viewing one of them, uh, certainly uh, this thing called looking glass that Dan Beerish talked about. Which and is looking what's into called, another dimension? This is a, a means by which they can see the person's trajectory. It's, it's basically, um, for all intents and purposes, most likely a, a form of alien artificial intelligence. The aliens have had the ability and have given the, some of those those abilities to us, those, those technologies, I guess you would call it, to look into the future and see it's a matter of probability. It doesn't mean it will happen, but if it has like a 90% probability, it's very likely that it will. Mm -hmm. They can see a person's path. life path in this life, and they can chart it, the probability that you're going to do this or that. So they may, they could, in theory, know who I was and where I was going at a young age. I know I was heavily surveilled since childhood. Why? One of the reasons I know that is because, and I tell this on several interviews, I, um, when I was, I, I don't know, around 11 years old, I, I went on a, or maybe even younger, I went to a, a on a childhood a school field trip to NASA, to Ames Research. I grew up in the Bay Area in Northern California. All right and near the home of Apple Computer, and Apple Computer didn't exist back then, but nonetheless. And I walked into the place with my school companions, and I looked around and I recognized it and said I knew exactly where I was. Oh. Um, and the only way that could happen is if I had, you know, prior knowledge. And so I have to say that... Um, 
you know, there's a number of things like that in my childhood what, that mm. I can look back. And so, you know, that's how I know. Do you think you were part of an experiment you don't know about? Um, I think we're all part of an experiment we don't know about. I mean, I think that's what humanity is. We are a grand experiment. Right, organized in this three-dimensional world. Yes, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a grand play. It's uh, for the purposes of enlightenment, in mm -hmm. my view. So talk about mind control for a moment. I know that's a topic you've talked about a lot over the years and most re researchers have. How widespread is it? How many people are actually under the influence of mind control? And what is trauma-based and what is more like, say, um, a collective mind control, if you will? Television is an instrument of mind control. So since television has been around, we have had mind control. But the Nazis were involved in, in you know, uh, researching and, and experimenting and using mind control uh, in the early days of, of Nazi Germany. We know that. Um, I can say mind control likely goes back as far as humanity does on this planet, which is several seedings going back, you know, millions of years, mm. much further back than conventional science will tell you. So I'm sure that they did mind control in Egypt, for example. I mean, advertising is mind control. Religion is gigantic mind control program. I mean, and one of probably the most successful, if you want to say, on the planet. Um, education is mind control. I mean. In a certain sense, controlling the mind is the name of the game. And to become a master, to become a spiritual master, you must learn to control your own mind. But when you decide to control the minds of others, then you're ex, you know, exercising this power over others again. So this is extremely pervasive. Some of the trauma-based mind control slaves supposedly they came out after a certain amount of deprogramming and talked openly about their experiences as a governmental mind-controlled slave what do you think is true or not about that we've heard about kathy o'brien and we've heard about bryce taylor and and others are they uh legitimate is sure. what, what they're talking about involves and and staggering and incredible amount of very famous names in their books and people that they were involved with on a governmental level and also celebrities. What do you know about that? Well, I think, first of all, when you look at all this uh, information, you have to keep in mind there is multiple realities. And this, I, I think the person who wrote most eloquently about this was uh, in the Seth material by Jane Roberts, who was in contact with a being called Seth. And I read those books when I was uh, around 12 years old. Um, so if you understand that we have multiple realities and we definitely have a parallel reality to this particular reality and probably parallel realities in every, you know, there's a light, there's a dark, there's a yin, there's a yang, that this, you, you know, multiverse is part of that. And, and so it's mm -hmm. constantly like that. But in essence, um, you know, mind control can, can be uh, sort of exercised in any of those realities. And so one of the things the Illuminati and the scientists have learned to do is to deal with your astral body as opposed to your physical body. And to get your astral body to do and to believe certain things and to actually activate it and to exercise it in certain other realities to do their bidding. So I think that some of the time when a, somebody has an implanted memory of being sexually abused by, let's say, a senator or a congressman or, or president or whoever it is, um, I think it may be uh, happening in the astral. So it's not real? It's, no, Physically on the real. contrary. It's important to understand, you know, again, it has to do with how much you how materially based you are. Mm -hmm. You know, dreams and the dream world are really excursions into other realities, in my view. So they're not imaginary in the sense that you would think about them. They're, they're also physical. They're as real as this is. Uh -huh. And they have as much impact on the overall sort of human complex that is, as, is called you as everything, anything else anything that happens in this reality. We flicker in and out of this reality. 
We're actually even sitting in your own body at this moment. You're not here all the time and neither am I. Our consciousness is constantly going in and out and going elsewhere. Um, and sometimes you can tap into this if you pay very close attention to where your mind goes in your thought patterns. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you re realize that, oh, I wasn't here, I was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get pieces of conversation that were going on wherever you happen to have gone. So it's, you know, we are, humans are very complex and very, you know, we are spirit first is the way I like to say it mm -hmm. um, and the way I understand it. And so we are not, this again is a vehicle in this what we call material and mm. it looks very solid mm. but even scientists will tell you it's simply that these molecules whatever you want to call it electrons are moving slower and so like you get a stone that is seeming more solid than a piece of paper for example it's all to do with you can walk through mm. walls and this is obviously something the men who stare at but boats. everything is made out of atoms right and yeah, if you go if, really close to you, that it's not solid it, yeah and if if you also learn to sort of change the aspect of your physicality mm -hmm. you can actually walk through a wall for example if you match yourself with the the, the pace of those atoms mm. and and so on this is something the cia has investigated in great depth mm -hmm. So a lot of those mind control um, witnesses or reports is not necessarily real in the way that they describe it? it it's as real as anything. And sometimes it may be absolutely real. Mm -hmm. Their body may be you know, used and abused in this reality exactly as they describe it. All I'm saying is that's not the only way you can be used and abused. Right. The good, you know, the good news is that you can be used and abused on many of the levels beyond this one, mm. the 3D, mm -hmm. what we call the 3D and this particular reality that you think you're in now. Mm. When a reality we are, it depends how, you know, I, I'm not a person who, who li likes numbers all that much, but for example, Ashiana Dean, someone I interviewed who is in contact with, with what she calls the guardian races. Uh, that I have also apparently been in contact with will tell you that we have 12 simultaneous incarnations going on at any given time. Oh. Not just in this reality, but others. Mm -hmm. In other words, that you, that I have, have 12 other, you know, 12 bodies operational at any given time. You know, it's, we are time travelers by na nature. That's what a human being is. So this is really what we're talking about. You know, it's very important. I mean, quantum physics is starting to understand these, these concepts. Scientists are going there, okay? Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about, what I understand sort of um, innately, if you want to call it that. Uh, this is, you know, again, enhanced my work because I, I don't know where I get all of this, but I know that I understand it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, it doesn't really matter whether you believe or you don't believe. It's it's there, you know. It's there. It's mm -hmm. it's real anyway. It doesn't require your belief mm -hmm. for it, for something to be real. I just I think it's important to say that. Right. So the television show called Fringe was actually mm -hmm. quite real. Oh, very. Very real, yeah. and they were inspired by. What? what I'm talking about, multiple realities, right. things that scientists and people like Geordi Rose with mm. D-Wave are, are talking about. And the X-Files as well. Absolutely. And even the philosophy. I or mean, the... Stranger Things is, is another uh, current right. television mm -hmm. hit that, uh, that addresses this as so, well. They can be believe it's just a movie or just, you know, it's fiction. Mm -hmm. But you see, humans are also extremely intuitive by nature. And we know when someone is lying to us, for example. We may not acknowledge that we know. We may need to sort of get out from under our own stuff in order to realize what we really do see. A lot of people like to deny what their true self is telling them for a long time until they reach a place where they absolutely have to listen for one reason or another. Uh, maybe because it'll save their life and then their life will be transformed forever. In other words, we know a lot more than we think we know and we've been taught through programming to think we don't know you're supposed to think that only experts know and that you don't know this is an illusion as well 
And what they're saying on television networks. and in the news. Yes, of course. That, you know, in other words, we can sense when our government is lying to us. We, and, and now, I mean, the lies are so prolific and so constant that if you turn on the news, you're going to be lied to constantly. Mm -hmm. um, this reality has been a lie in many ways. Um, but you have to remember that we elected to come here and experience this. You as a soul, every soul, has a reason for doing that, for coming here. A At this mission, particular time. At any particular time. In other words, they have a mission. They have something they want to accomplish. They have a reason for being, a reason for going through these experiences. And, and so I, I think it's just important to know if, if you volunteered to be here and if you can get in touch with yourself on a deep level to find out why, then you may um, sort of embrace your reality in a much more healthy way. Hmm. And ultimately, that means, you know, I have a friend who was feeling ill and I said, so why are you ill? And they said, well, I just feel ill. I don't. And they don't understand that there is levels of things happen in the uh, what you may, may say, the ether, other dimensions. This is one of the last dimensions where something will come down into material reality. That's the last stage. Mm. In other words, you have cancer long before it materializes, mm -hmm. you know, and by the same token, you can heal yourself by going back down that path. Mm -hmm. In other words, backtracking it. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Bartlett is somebody I interviewed who, who uses this in what he calls matrix energetics. In other words, if you have an injury, he, he has learned a technique in which you can walk a, back, a person back through that experience such that that experience can be unhap can unhappen. And in doing so, you can heal yourself. Wow. And he has many in his books, many much evidence of this. So, you know, this is, it's understanding that this in a, is an illusion, mm. you know. Louise Hay always talked about heal your body. She had a very famous book that mm. was called that. What do you think of Louise Hay's work that it's a thought pattern, it's something, it's, well, in essence, the law of attraction. I think the law of attraction is, is very, uh, one of the real laws, but I also think the law of opposition is, is also a law. So mm -hmm. um, I think there's, you know, it's again, a popular thing to talk about what one attracts. But mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing that they say is that one of the things that you, when you reject something, you attract it. So right. it's an interesting dichotomy. You know, mm -hmm. the Illuminati are very familiar with this and occult knowledge is familiar with this, which is, you know, the information that they base their philosophy on. In other words, in, a, in a, it's um, thesis, antithesis, uh, synthesis. That is the, the triangle and that is the paradigm for this uh, this reality. And so what in essence you need to do is get to that place of synthesis. You have to take the opposites and get to that place where they sort of rule, you know, are null and void. And then you're back to, to the beginning again. So it's understanding that that process exists and not fighting it, you know, not fighting the one side over the other side, but understanding they're both going to be resulting from any action mm -hmm. in this. Uh, it's, it's just the laws of the way this this universe works. And you can learn to deal with it in a better way because you understand that right, something, some obstacles will come. Right, and not to uh, encourage the negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You can also attract the good, you know. <laughs> of course, yes. So, uh, sure. So, you, you, you talked about the news and we were being lied to. We mm -hmm. were talking about the fake news. What is, what is actually going on when we're seeing all the news reports around the world and we are experiencing all of these terrible terror attacks around the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? You have certainly made many shows about that. As we look back in history, from what I understand now, there are more and more incidents that we thought were, you know, negative things like the attack on Pearl Harbor or other ones mm -hmm. where basically they were created by the very, very people. Yes, by the people who supposedly were affected by them, just like 9-11. So yes, I mean, false flags are, are part of the way this state 
tries to exercise its will over humanity and to frighten people. Is that the reason they're doing it? The reason is to control, always having power over, always controlling humanity. Why? Because they want to be on top. They want power over others. They want to feed off of humanity. And in order to do so, they must keep control over you because you may go elsewhere. It's like revealing that uh, aliens exist will tell, will actually put them in a place of not having any power because suddenly races that have, you know, bigger, better, faster machines than you and possibly are smarter or more evolved, mm. at least at this stage in the game or appearing to be, will be more powerful over you. And the last thing an Illuminati ever wants to be is the, the man on the bottom, so to speak. Mm. The, so this is what the entire secret space program is all about. It's all about conquering the worlds, being on top. When you go out into space, being the one in control. This is, you know, these are their choices. Now, there's a part of the secret space program that is all about protecting humans and protecting Earth in a good way. And there's a part of that sort of contingent that has begun to break away. And this is why we have some of the things, the arrests uh, that... Trump is involved in, hmm. in uh, working on and so on and so forth. There are white hats. There are good people hmm. out there that people that have even worked for the dark side, like a whistleblower for sometimes 15, 20, 40 years, have suddenly had a crisis of conscience, are getting close. A lot of whistleblowers are quite old, in case you didn't notice. The reason they get to that place is because they realize they're going to leave this reality mm -hmm. and they may have sort of an inkling that they're going to have to come back and repeat it and that they did some, some people a great deal of wrong, mm -hmm. that they may have done humanity some, some disservice. Mm -hmm. So suddenly they want to change their path and they want to go on to the path of the light. Mm -hmm. And so they, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's happening and the secret space program is no exception. And the members of it are now sort of changing their ways and deciding that they need to educate most of humanity who that is completely in the dark. They need to actually use people like Project Camelot and others to reveal some of the truths that they've known all along. Get it out there. Right. And so they now, where they were stopping us uh, last, let's say, three years ago, suddenly they're allowing us. Mm -hmm because it's serving their agenda. You've got to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those reasons for doing what appears to be doing good may actually serve a, a darker agenda. So that's, that's also part of the story. Trump, who is he? Why is he in the position that he is right now as, a as the, probably the most hated president of the United States ever? I understand there's a large contingent on the, I guess, on the left that supposedly hates him. But I don't, you know, I think that he was created in the role he's playing to be uh, draw fire, if you will. He is, uh, I think, and I do think he's playing a role. I saw his birth chart. Um, I had did a show with a, a, an astrologer, um, Maxine Taylor, who's quite a good astrologer. And one of the things that came out, in, and I do read astrology um, charts, mm -hmm. and I, I could see that he was the trickster. That was, that's a very big part of his chart. He has a lot of stuff in the 12th house, which is, you know, hidden relationships, etc. I I think that he is doing a job. I think he's agreed to do a job. I think he was supposed to draw fire and he is uh, supposed to have attracted a certain sector of the American public. The election was, in essence, stolen from the dark side. That's how it happened. It wasn't people voting. This is complete nonsense. Uh, this is not the way presidents Smoke are elected. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Um, the reality is that, that what they did do was they did infiltrate the technology in such a way that was being stolen for Hillary to steal it back for Trump. Mm -hmm. That that was a kind of a, you could call it a technical, a mm -hmm. technology coup right. by a sort of um, a coup d'etat in our government mm -hmm. that took place. But why would they allow Trump to be in that position? Because Trump is representing uh, a growing side of the military that is rebelling against the 
established order. Really? So they're kind of, it's kind of the white hats who have yes. put him in that position yeah, in that, order to, yes. to make a conflict within the New World Order structure? Yeah, there was there was always been conflicts within the New World Order. There are factions that are hate each other, you know, um, every bit as much as they hate humanity. <laughs> um, so you know, I th this is what I think is going on uh, now. How long this will be allowed? How much uh, how much power they really do have? Whether they will be successful in the long run, I think, mm -hmm. is yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. But I think there are many reasons why he probably was chosen for the role. He's, he's a showman, you know, mm. he's a grand Reality show star, really. Well, there you go. But, you know, um, I think there's also some, I guess you might say, a, a different way of playing the political game than ever was quite played before. Uh, the people that are backing him I think are, uh, some of these people are playing for the other side, appearing to be uh, something other than who, who they truly are. And they may be working for the light and appear to be uh, dark characters. Uh -huh. And I think Trump himself is such a person. So this he's is not my a view. puppet put in that, uh, in that position in order for people to really hate on him and then, uh, and then direct their attention to a new kind of savior or kind of a person who, well, like whatever, Obama, who's more charming and uh, coming into the picture afterwards. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's kind of the union of opposites that keeps happening. Mm. In other words, Obama was supposed to be somebody who was going to live up to a lot of his promises Change. who did the complete opposite. Trump is supposed to be somebody who changes his mind every minute, but in reality is doing some very good things behind the scenes. Really? Uh, absolutely. So. This is the kind of thing going on. In other words, I, I think that politics is a hall of mirrors, mm. and it's important to, for people to keep that. And in you mind. don't vote. No, I don't. I think right. that voting is a complete illusion. So how come I, Trump was elected in what November or, or December 2016? Well, look, he, he was chosen by a faction that right. then stole the the election by mm -hmm. using the technology that's available. But half a year prior to that, that he was elected, whatever, in May 2016, he went uh, and had a meeting with Henry Kissinger. Yeah, and actually Jared Kushner uh, is, is actually met with K Kissinger as well. You know, it's interesting to look at the story and, and try to decide who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And at every juncture, you begin to see that some of these guys have played for both sides and keep flipping between the two whenever it suits them. So it's important to sort of follow a through line if you can. And it's not easy. Um, I think that the all you can do is you can judge a man by his deeds. So until the deeds have happened, we won't be able to judge the man, will we? So when you look at a presidency, I'm afraid that's what we're left with. I think at this point, it doesn't matter if he's a womanizer. Sometimes he acts kind of crazy, but actually to me, he acts more human and more realistically than, you know, I believe these other people that have been in office, people that are supposedly respected, are probably way crazier than Trump ever dreamed of being. Being, it's just my view. Um, you know, I think that the the image is an illusion. It's like many of these pedophiles are highly respected members of society, like Jimmy Savile uh, in Britain, and and there's so many of them that you know, in essence. These people were respected. They were supposed to be good guys or whatever you want to call it, stars, respected people. And in fact, they were the complete opposite of the way they appeared. So it's, I think it's a, it's a learning experience for humans to try to decipher what is the plot. You know, that's something I talk about in my lectures. I ask the question, when you're here on earth, you need to say, what is the plot? You're part of a grand play as Shakespeare would say, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you need to find out what's your role? You know, what is the plot? What is the storyline? What is the su su supposed storyline? Mm -hmm. You know, and then, and what's the emperor's new clothes? Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and so some of the people Follow that are... Follow your intuition. Yeah, absolutely. And, and your own inner sort of knowing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, do a lot force. of research. Uh, right. Educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, it doesn't matter when somebody is loved or hated. This too is an illusion. You know, some of the most horrible people have been supposedly loved by pop, you know, going by, going by popularity. But even that may be a, a grand illusion. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, do we really know how many people really hate Trump and what do they hate him for exactly? And even if you were to take votes, a ballot box, and find out how many people supposedly are going to vote that they hate Trump. The ballots would be faked. It would be infiltrated. Right. Our voting process has been infiltrated. What is real? What forever. is not? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it doesn't matter. That's it's just nonsense. You know. It's right. it, try to judge a person by their deeds and let's see what happens. That's what matters. Now on to a very important topic that you've talked a lot about, interviewed a lot of people about. Alien races. How many alien races do you know of? Or do you, have you heard about or do you know exist? Please tell us about that. I have to say that one of the things that went into mainstream science has made popular recently has been that there are, if I remember the numbers correctly, It's something like billions of Earth-like planets that scientists have now found out in other galaxies beyond ours, and including ours. May even be in our galaxy. I forget the exact quote. Uh, what does that mean? That means that as far as alien races, the possibility that those Earth-like planets, some portion of them contain life, and that some portion of those that life growing up on a planet that is similar you know, to ours, mm -hmm. means, in essence, we're talking about races of humanoids. So then you have to gel down billions to, I don't know, hundreds of millions or thousands, whatever you want to do. In other words, it's ludicrous to think about how many aliens or other beings are there. I always say to people, you know, why do you want to limit the imagination of God? Mm -hmm. I don't how see God as you... a person. I see the creator, the what is endlessly creative. Why not every form of life you can ever imagine being alive Say there somewhere. is an infinite number. How many do you know of or have you spoken to people about how many? Look, I've had alien or... interaction. I've, I've seen, I, I mean, even before Camelot, I, when, when very sort of striking experience I had was I was sleeping or thought I was sleeping, whatever you call sleeping, sleeping, which I think people don't understand. But nonetheless, I was in some state and there was a little old man sitting by my bed talking to me all night long. And we were having a discussion. I have no idea about what. I started to come into consciousness and right at the last minute, I turned to him and said, wait a minute, what planet are you from? Because I finally, you know, I was lucid dreaming at that point thinking, damn it, this time I'm going to ask. It was the kind of thing where I talked to lots of aliens and this was one alien I was going to frickin' ask, where are you from? And he said Andromeda and I woke up. So years later, I came across Alex Collier and his interaction with a small, bald head old man who was uh, very instrumental in his, his information about uh, these Andromedans. And that was what you call a coincidence. Or maybe not. Maybe it was a synchronicity. Maybe it was the same frickin' old man. I don't know. Mm. All I know is that when he told me he was from Andromeda, I woke up thinking, damn it, you know, here I finally remember meeting an alien and he just looks like a little old man. I was so disappointed that he wasn't more exotic looking, you know. I don't know. Took another green. form? I, I have no idea. All I know is that th this was my reaction. Mm -hmm. So you're asking me what aliens I am. I know that I was abducted by greys when I was a young child. Um, I do have uh, typical abduction sort of uh, memories. I also have a, an intuitive awareness of grey alien bases and where they are. Mm -hmm. Are I the greys hybrids, clones? There are many different kinds of greys. So let's first say that. So there are gray beings that are descended from the reptilians line. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and there are biological programmable entities that have been created not only by our government but by uh, other alien races in a sense artificial intelligent little creature beings um, there are lots lots and lots of different kinds of rays what's hidden on planet earth and why isis is destroying a lot of the monuments in the middle east uh, is because the history of the dominance of reptilians over humans is inscribed on those temples and they don't want to reveal this information. It's all over Turkey, and I've been you know, told by researchers this is the case. It's all over Sardinia. It's all over the earth in various places. Evidence that reptilians were in charge or in, in you know, dominating uh, human beings at some sector in our, our past, here on planet earth, as well as in other galaxies, because the reptilians are a marauding species that go around taking over other planets because they are based on a hierarchical power system and they are all about feeding on other beings mm -hmm. and they are follow a, a dark path. Now, not all reptilians are still on a dark path, so it's important to say there are many species of reptilians and apparently, according to one of my witnesses, Mark Richards, the raptors who are descendant uh, from the dinosaurs etc. Uh, they have evolved to a place where they're not helping our military. They're no longer eating and feeding off humans. Uh, the mantid being, beings, according to Simon Parks, a British counselor who is... Praying mantis looking beings. Praying mantis All right. looking beings. Okay. Uh, used to feed on humans every bit as viciously as the reptilians, but now have started to turn towards a positive, more ascension, what is called an ascension pathway. This is according to Simon Parks, who considers himself descended from, uh, in large part, not only being human, but also being a, a large part of a mantis DNA. There are, you know, there are lots of, there are Pleiadians. I have reason to believe I'm related to at least a portion of the Pleiadians. Nordics? Uh, Nordics they are, there are many different races of Nordics. Pleiadians are one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there are those kinds of beings. There are, you know, there are many, many different kinds. So of There are insectoid beings. There right. are, you know, ant-like beings. There are, I mean, there's in many... Uh, Who are in highly fact, involved. Is that it? No, not necessarily highly involved. In fact, if they are as high as 4D, they are actually pretty low-level uh, life forms. Mm -hmm. They don't really occupy the higher dimensions mm -hmm. in a spiritual sense. Um, but... I can say that I think my theory at this point is that look at every creature that is on the earth. Every single creature is a miniature, often a miniature, but sometimes, you know, larger, like a big cat, is a reflection of an alien race. Mm -hmm. And that they were planted here as part of this huge genome that is called this human experiment that we then came to inhabit these bodies. So your cat is a descended from the cat beings. Your dog is descended from the dog beings. Your, you know, it, a, a butterfly is descended from, from whatever kind of, you know, worm or whatever kind of being that is. You know, in other words, I think that the aliens that create this, this, this uh, terraform an earth, mm -hmm. create an earth-like place for a species such as a human to come in and experience and all these other life forms, they actually create the life forms. Mm. We are a humanoid life form, right? We are a composite being. Are we a hybrid? hybrid? Absolutely. Um, and that's why we have the reptilian mind. We, I, think, I think that there are at least 12 s sort of substantial alien races that contributed to creating this body uh, mind complex uh -huh. that we call a human. It's a vehicle. We're Lemuria spirit first. And, and you must understand the war with the reptilians is one that the Pleiadians have been involved in for eons. Mm -hmm. um, that they want humans to continue to fight that, that enemy of theirs, to help them in their fight, in their battle, to take back their lands in, in the solar systems, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are talking about reptilians being part of the overlords that, that control our governments. Sure. True or not? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the reptilian, you know, Anunnaki were also, their race was infiltrated. They're a humanoid race in my view. 
that then were infiltrated by the reptilians, and then you get what is called, I believe, the Syrian Anunnaki, which are reptilian, more reptilian than human. Okay. But most of the real uh, sort of original bloodline of the Anunnaki is not reptilian, it's uh, a humanoid. And so what you get is we have a lot of uh, Anunnaki that are still here in influencing our governments. We have Syrian Anunnaki, which are reptilian Anunnaki that are certainly vying for control. You know, we have a lot of factions out there vying for control over this human experiment. But the reptilians are one of our primary enemies, if you will. And the Illuminati know about that? Or part they're, of it? They're descended from them. They have, some of them have the widest, uh, the largest amount of reptilian DNA. This is why, again, they're in positions of dominance. So can they shapeshift, as David sure. Icke and other people Absolutely. say? Real? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't think shape-shifting or leaving your body and coming back or occupying another body, this sort of thing. I mean, humans are capable of this as well. So this is not such a unique skill. What is the best evidence we have for ordinary people who hear this for the first time, maybe? Was this like outrageous, wild claims and something from a sci-fi film? So if we just talk to some people who are hearing this for the first time, let's say, and not been researching this for years. Okay. One, one thing I can say is, is my own experience, okay? Mm -hmm. When I grew up, I believed that there were all kinds of beings and a, you know, other dimensions, etc. I had a very open mind to all of this. I did a tremendous amount of reading when I was a kid. I had a huge imagination, but this is what I believed. Now, when I reached the age, I, I was somewhere in my, um, I don't know, 20s, 30s, whatever it was. I, um, there had been a movie called V. It's the original V, not the, not the more recent V, but the very original television yes, series. from the 80s, right? And I thought that was a lie. I thought they made that up, that there would be reptilian beings, because of all the beings, I didn't believe that reptilians were real at that age. And then what happened was, and this was not long before Camelot, but it was a few years before, I went into a meditation and I was wide awake. I was sitting, you know, cross-legged on my, my bed at the time. And I somehow tripped into uh, interdimensional reality. And I wasn't asleep, <clears throat> but I wasn't completely in that meditational state, whatever that is, depending on, you know, theta, beta, all this kind of thing. Um, so basically what happened was I saw a flying reptilian, which I didn't even know existed, uh, with scales in the whole thing, which was, is a called wing. a shikar, a winged dragon, which is a reptilian. Um, go by me and I could I knew it was a consciousness and I knew he saw me he wanted me to see him and I snapped in that you know couple seconds back into this reality and I realized I didn't forget what I'd seen which usually you do but I didn't and I realized that indeed that was a reptilian and that reptilian wanted me to know that he was very real and from then on I knew Without a doubt, reptilians are real. So I didn't need David Icke to tell me reptilians were real because this happened long before David Icke. So have they seen, seen sure. them with their own eyes? David Icke has seen them. He has seen them? And so have I. And I'm not going to elaborate. Um, I know certain people that are very much involved with being reptilian. And with I being can say, yeah. Reptilian. In other words, that they have a high degree of reptilian DNA that they can sh shape shift. Some of them are occupied by reptilians that come and go. You know, this kind of thing. This is what's going on in our reality. Wow. And you can't, you don't want to tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, I'm not going to name names if no. that's what you'd ask. No, that's fine. But yeah. if you know, I've them. also had many witnesses that have talked about reptilians, mm -hmm. and I've also had other encounters with reptilians in my own, you know, sort of in my dream life in a very graphic way, but also in discussions with other people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I have an interview uh, with Melinda Leslie, for example. She talks in depth about their dealings with a reptilian. I can say that I've had I. Uh, there are other people that have dealt with reptilians that okay. have given me their stories. The truth will happen to you. And so it doesn't matter what I say. It really doesn't. All you can do is use your own experiences um, 
use your own intuition to go through life. And eventually, the, the things that I'm saying to you, I would basically say are basically true and you will find them for yourself. Um, by the way, the, the Hopi race, uh, I have the engines, uh, yeah. members of the Hopi who have told me that the Hopi God is a reptilian. Really? The one who they oh. supposedly worship. And uh, that this is a, not a nice reptilian, but actually vindictive reptilian. So I'm not saying all Hopi worship this particular being, but I can tell you that uh, Hopi has told me this, and I believe him, absolutely. Oh, very interesting. How is the planet Saturn involved in all of this humanity, our, our dimension, and those alien races? I interviewed a man called Norm Bergram, another very important Camelot witness, who uh, I urge everyone to watch my interview. He disappeared not long after I interviewed disappeared. him. Disappeared? Yes. He believed at the time I interviewed him that he was an older man. He, I think it was 83 or 85 when I interviewed him. He was smart as a whip. He had worked in black projects underground in Moffett Field in Northern California in Palo Alto for mm -hmm most of his career, well over 30 years. And he was a very, uh, intre you know, a scientist who was still very much alive and vibrant at his old age. And um, he talked about, he, he wrote a book called The Ringmakers Ring. of Saturn. Mm -hmm. And John Lear is the one who told us about him. And he had met him and talked with him. And um, you indeed, did a great interview believed, with him, yeah. Yeah, he believed that the, uh, the beings in Saturn that created the rings are being created by the ships that are in those rings, that they create the rings somehow. In order to do what? I, I have no idea. Um, I'm just telling you his theory. And uh, Saturn does appear to have a um, rule over Earth on some level. Whether it comes from the past, it certainly comes from the past, but whether it, it's as potent now as it was in the past, I don't know. Um, there are many unanswered questions regarding Saturn and the relationship between Earth and Saturn. Yeah, some people say they are, it, it's projecting our reality from the I mean, rings. Saturn, Satan, and these things all go together when you start studying the symbolism, if you study the work of Jordan Maxwell and certainly the information that he got from... Mm -hmm. um, from, uh, oh God, what's his name? Anyway, I can't remember. Um, all I can say, it's in the symbolism. So Saturn is, is associated with time and astrology. Mm -hmm. Again, time would be a kind of a taskmaster. Mm -hmm. Saturn is often in astrology. The, the Grim Reaper. Yeah, Reaver. the planet in which you are paid. You are actually paid for uh, your sins, but you're also uh, getting honors if you've, supposedly done well. So there is some kind of uh, ruler relationship, I'd say, with humanity and the beings of Saturn. Uh, it's quite possible that these are not positively oriented beings. Mm -hmm. And is that connected to the moon? What is going on in the moon? We have a picture here of the moon landing. Is that, was that real or not? Can you say? Uh, well, I, what I would say is based on all my research and all of the information I've gotten from all the witnesses I've talked to in depth, I would say we did go to the moon, but we had help, as one of my witnesses has said many times. And that, uh, you know, in fact, Jay Widener, I think, has written a book, I don't know if he's released it yet, about how um, Stanley Kubrick uh, basically was part of the sort of fake moon landing scenario and that he did a service to the secret space program. So Kubrick uh, directed the moon landing that we saw in 1969. Absolutely, and or made films of it. Yes, it made a film that was supposed to substitute for what really went on. So what we saw was not real. Right. But something real happened. Yes. Right. And William Tompkins, uh, another very important witness who died recently, that you have interviewed, um, that yeah, I interviewed, very good. Talked. He actually fills in those gaps. He he makes it clear how that that trajectory happened, how we were helped. Mm -hmm. He he actually was part of that effort to, uh, and he talks about you know the astronauts seeing reptilians on the moon, etc., really? telling them yeah. to leave. Yes. Mm -hmm. So fascinating stuff. But yeah, absolutely. There is a long 
story involved there. What I wanted to say was that I guess Stanley Kubrick, according to Jay Widener, he says that he thinks he actually is not dead, that he may have actually been given um, sort of a second lease on life and, and may be living in the Mars colonies that we have. The Mars colonies. Can you just talk a little bit about that? <laughs> that yeah. There is lots of information about uh, colonies and underground bases that we have on the moon and Mars. Absolutely. Mm. We're also terraforming other planets, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, mm. according to my witnesses. There is a moon on Sa uh, one of Saturn's moons that look like the Death Star in Star Wars. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are what we call red in. What does that mean? Some Can you artists that? Like, like Arthur C. Clarke have been given knowledge. They've had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but they have their work involves the information they have been given as part of the disclosure program. Do we know that? I know it. I can tell you that all the evidence that I have substantiates the statement I just made. Okay. That's why he, that in Star Wars, who so was made in knew, the 70s, yes, could be... He, he knows what he's doing. Dark side, light side, Absolutely. Em evil empire very, and rebellion. Very accurate stuff. But, you know, you have to also realize that artists base their work on other artists' work. So there are precedents for some of, the, of what Lucas was talking about mm -hmm. out there in the literature, even before he created his screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no doubt he was, you know, probably helped, as was Spielberg, and with Close Encounters, etc. Mm -hmm. It's very fascinating. Yeah. So when people hear all of this and all of these incredible things, and they can really research for years, what is your best advice for them to do when they hear this? Because a lot of people can be very filled up with fear and go and maybe into a very dark and very, be very sad about all of this. What, what is your best advice for people to do? Well, I don't know why people wouldn't want to embrace the sort of miraculousness of, of all of this, because it is far more than people are led to believe. They don't, weren't born to work an eight hour a day job come home, drink beer on, on the couch and watch TV and then go to sleep and start all over the next day. You know, there's much more to this than that. And um, what I'm doing is kind of through my explorations and through my talking to people who have had, in many cases, direct experiences and also my own direct experiences, um, what I'm doing is sharing the wealth of information and knowledge that's out there if you want to find it, it's, you know, it's out there, yeah. um, as the X-Files says, you know, and the truth is out there. It's, it's all here and it, it's much more miraculous. It's much more yeah. complex. It's much, you know, there's no reason to dwell in a world of limitation and reductionism and thinking, you know, someone is, you're born to be hit on the head over and over again and to be a slave and all of this. What's the point of that kind of thought process. Isn't it much more exciting to realize that the creator, however you envision that, the force, is endlessly creating. And so there is no limits. That's what's miraculous about this thing we call life, is how unlimited it truly is. And I think embracing the possibilities, whether you want to believe in them completely doesn't matter. It, they don't need your belief, okay? The creator doesn't need your belief, nor does he or she or whatever it need your worship. This is an illusion. It's fine. It doesn't care whether you worship it. It's, an, it's absolutely immaterial. It might matter to you. You might feel better if you do it. Maybe that's reason enough to do it. But, you know, I think, I don't know. I just, I think people are just sort of, reside in a lot of stupidity. I think they accept things that they're told by other people because they've been told to accept the voice of authority. I don't accept the voice of authority on anything except my own. So no fear. I think, you know, I'm afraid I can't pay my rent next month. That's my fear. That's a very practical fear. I mm -hmm. hope I'll make enough money by doing this crazy job I do to pay my rent. 
would I be stupid? Am I stupid to fear? Should I just get rid of that? I think I should. But you know what? It's a very basic human You're instinct to human. wonder if, you know, if I'm going to eat tomorrow, if I'm going to uh, go around a corner, a dark corner and be, you know, kidnapped or killed or, you know, I'm not stupid. If you are intelligent, I think you understand fear. Fear is what can warn you before something happens. If you get some kind of stimulus mm. that actually makes you realize that you're, it's sort of that instinct to stay, I want to stay in this reality in this body. That's probably really the definition of fear. If you don't care, if you stay in this reality in this body, then you have no fear, zero, period. And in reality, that's where we all should be. I mean, the reason I did Camelot, I knew that there was danger. I don't care. I mean, call me courageous if you want, but I'm not stupid. I know it's dangerous. That scares me, but at the same time, I don't care about the fear. I go beyond it. I, I realize that this life, living this life has no meaning for me if I, I can't move beyond the fear and do what I want uh, anyway. So you I don't encourage care if I courage, die. really? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, the only way to live. And, you know, I'm not going to stop doing that. Um, it served me well in my life. And so I highly recommend it. I think, you know, living beyond the fear, living with courage is, mm. is the best way to live. It's, in essence, it's the best revenge. You certainly have yeah. been brave, and you are brave, and very courageous, and you've done some incredible work that I think will live on for a long time. And Thank um, you. I want to say that we are very happy to have done this interview with you, and thank you for being on Age of Truth TV, Carrie Cassidy. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you.